Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to Horus Heresy Lore Breakdowns. After a long break, quote unquote, whilst I was dealing with Vrax. And what a book to return to as well. Number 14, The First Heretic. This is quite the little book. I must have started and finished this video like three times before I've come to this one, and we'll see if this one sticks. You'll know because, well, you'll be watching it. Because it is a difficult book to analyze and present in a worthwhile fashion, which is why I've decided to split it into two parts, the mind of Lorgar Aurelian and this one, the general lore breakdown, because Lorgar and how he views the world really is a bit of the star of this book, for better and for worse, and so I figured that was deserving of its own little video. Whilst we will be, of course, be touching upon that in this one as well, we'll try and keep it a little bit to a minimum here, because that was the problem I had with the previous videos. I kept reiterating Lorgar's mind, basically, explaining why the things he seemed to think appeared to be contradictionary both to how he had previously thought and how he had previously acted, how his actions and his beliefs seemed to be complete polar opposites of one another. And when I basically reiterated that like five or six times, I figured to myself, you know what, how about I just do this properly in a video instead, that'd be a bit better. So, let us get started with the first heretic, and immediately we start with a pair of interesting quotes that really embody this book, really. We start with one from an ancient warlord of terror, accusing the emperor of being nothing but a tyrant, stating that it is better to die in the waning days of freedom than to live in the dawning days of tyranny. It is of course important to point out that to a man about to be beheaded, the man holding the axe is invariably going to appear as a tyrant. That is pretty much the inescapable optics of such a situation. But of course, this guy's definition of freedom is probably not one most of us would subscribe to. These were warlords, brutal killers, many of which were more than tangentially connected to chaos itself. Their idea of freedom was their personal freedom. It was not freedom for the masses, for as many people as possible, or for just people in general. It was freedom for those powerful and ruthless enough to take it. And this is a distinction that seems utterly lost on the Horus Heresy series. The more we progress through it, the more the Emperor is presented in a really odd light. As if he's almost a bit of an idiot, really, as we'll see examples of in this very book, and he's presented as an out-and-out -out tyrant, as if his cause does not have a legitimate reason for his actions. The Emperor is fighting chaos itself, a force that threatens not just humanity, but the entire galaxy, if not, one might even say, the universe, and if fighting such a force requires one to institute essentially a militaristic atheist society, which cracks down upon people's freedom of religion, then well, yes, you certainly could call that tyranny, but I would also certainly call it justifiable tyranny. You might define the police as tyrannical, because they don't allow you to break into your neighbor's house and steal his shit. Nevertheless, very few of us would ever consider that to be any breach of anybody's real freedoms, or that the police stopping you from doing so would be considered tyranny. It is all about perspective. It is all about, well, the reality of the situation, and the force required to ensure, in this case, the literal survival of the species at large. This is why, regardless of how horribly autocratic and downright theocratic fascist a society that the Imperium is in the 41st millennium, it is still not an out-and-out -out evil force, because those overbearing authoritarian measures are literally there to prevent the species from being wiped out. And anyone who attempts to define that as evil, mere self-defense basically, well, 
they have an interesting uh, <laughs> perspective on the world. But we'll get back to the Emperor a lot more. In fact, I might even do a whole video talking about how the Horus Heresy portrays him, but I figured I want to get a little bit deeper into the series first in this Law Breakdown series before I get into that. And then we have a second quote from Lorgar. And this one is particularly important because it essentially shatters any pretense that Lorgar might ever have had of being a religious man. Somebody who does what he does due to religious conviction, or, well, the force of those convictions. Quoting, If a man gathers 10,000 sons in his hands, if a man seeds 10,000 worlds with his sons and daughters, granting them custody of the galaxy itself, if a man guides a million vessels through the infinite stars with a mere thought, then I pray you tell me, if you are able, how such a man is anything less than a god. End quote. And this is so incredibly vital because it tells us what it is Lorgard actually worships. He is not worshipping the Emperor. He is worshipping the Emperor's power, quite separate from the Emperor. He is not worshipping a deity here. He is worshipping observable reality, a measure of power. If a man gathers 10,000 suns in his hands, if a man sees 10,000 worlds, etc., this is not speaking of a deity. He's not talking about a god, or even the emperor particularly. He's talking about the power required to do these things. What Logar worships is therefore not a god, but merely just might. And this brings us on beautifully from the previous quote, which is essentially made by a warlord who subscribes to the idea that the highest degree of freedom possible is that in which every man is able to impose his will upon any other man if he is so able. Might makes right. And Lorga simply takes that one step further. Might not only makes right, might makes divine. And yet, despite this, throughout the book, various acts are attributed to precisely that. A god, something divine, something different, something above mere human understanding. This, of course, is a defense mechanism. Something entirely human, entirely natural even. When something happens to you, something so vast, something so great, so unfathomable that there is simply no way for your human mind to rationalize it within your very limited framework, it is easy to attribute such things to a god. As the old saying goes, there are no atheists in a foxhole. And that is an apt metaphor for this. Having sudden and overwhelming violence fall upon you from the sky without having any way whatsoever to affect whether or not you live or die. This is, again, something entirely natural to humanity. However, this is also something used as a continuous excuse by Lorgar. Lorgar is not a human. Lorgar is above humanity. For him to fall prey to such a base emotion as this seems almost unimaginable. And it is. Hell, Lorgar does not fall prey to it. This is not an excuse with which to defend Lorgar. Lorgar knows perfectly well that when something bad happens, or when he makes something bad happen, that it is not the fault of some ethereal mystical entity. He even says as much himself in his quote, he does not equate the God Emperor's power to a divine action, some Old Testament deity. He does not view the Emperor in the way of a traditional god. He views force and power as a manifestation of godhood, and therefore anyone who wields that power must, by extension, be a god. So make no mistake, Logard is entirely aware of this. He does not view it through a lens of what we would consider religion, but some of his followers do. The next excerpt is from Sirini, a woman we will get to know quite intimately throughout the book. 
She talks about how when the Ultramarines arrived and blasted apart Monarchia, we'll get to that in a second, she viewed that as a divine act. She even outright states, I don't talk about warfare or violence. But of course, she knows that was what happened. We know what happened. It was an orbital bombardment. It is an entirely scientific act. We know precisely why it happened, how it happened, and how it was caused. There was no magic wand involved, there was no divine power, there was simply just a very, very large gun. But for someone like Serini, someone already indoctrinated into the way of viewing the world that almost, no, not even almost, that outright requires faith, then yes. Undoubtedly, that would appear as so much more. She, her mind more precisely, is attributing a divine will to this act. This too, by the way, is one of the reasons why worship is so very dangerous in the 41st millennium. Because if anything can be attributed to divine intervention, which it can, it depends entirely upon how you're thinking, then that also means that almost any act within the galaxy can be attributed to, well, you know which deities I'm talking about here, don't you? This is why faith in and of itself is such a potent tool to the Chaos Gods, and undoubtedly why the Emperor was trying to eradicate it. But what about Monarchia then? The city that was destroyed by the 13th Legion, the Ultramarines. Why was it destroyed? Well, it was because it was a symbol. A symbol created by the word bearers. Monarchia was supposed to be their perfect city, their crowning achievement, and a justification for their way of viewing the world. A world in which faith is a vital part of humanity's existence. So vital, in fact, that they view it as even more important than fulfilling their primary goal. All of the legions are expected to expand outwards from humanity's home world of terror and conquer the galaxy for the Emperor. Out of all the legions, however, the word bearers by far were the slowest and most inefficient. By the time they had conquered ten worlds, other legions had conquered hundreds. And this could no longer be accepted. This too was one of the reasons why Monarchia was made into an example. The word bearers themselves viewed this as not so much a problem as an inevitable consequence of creating the perfect society. When they had conquered a world, the legionnaires would then descend upon the world and begin proselytizing to the population. They would convert them to their idea of religion, and they would not leave before that idea had taken firm root, been codified and established fully within that society as an indispensable part of it. And only then, once their perfect world had been established, would they move on. And I would like to stress that they were establishing perfect worlds by their own metrics, by their own definition of what a perfect world was. And that idea was reliant almost entirely upon faith. When a world had become perfect, in their eyes, was when that world had become compliant with their ideas of religion. Not when living standards had reached a certain point, or when society had evolved to a certain level, or anything like that. It was almost entirely based around faith. And so in reality, Monarchia probably would not reach up to anyone else's definition of perfect. When compared to the settlements of the 500 worlds of Ultramar, for example, it would certainly fall well short of that particular standard. The city is clearly steeped in religion, to a rather extreme degree, to the point where if one breaches a certain tradition, like touching a maiden wearing a scarlet shawl without her approval, it is apparently fair game for that maiden to brandish a knife at you presumably with the intent to use it. At that point, I think it is fair to say that we've gone far beyond the limits of mere tradition and well and truly into the realm of law. And of course, coming hand in hand with any theocratic society comes the rights and privileges 
of the clergyman. As it is mentioned in the book that the first people to be able to flee Monarchia when the evacuation order was issued were the rich, the merchants, the politicians and of course, the priesthood. Because strangely enough, whenever a religion becomes properly organised, it tends to figure out that it needs a little bit of recompense. Because after all, speaking to God is hard work and it is only fair that the church gets a small, modest portion of the population's earnings. <laughs> and anyone who's ever visited St. Peter's Basilica in Rome will know just how modest a portion that can be. So clearly, the good old fashioned class barriers are still in place. And these aren't even the ones that appear in any organised human society, those of social standing or wealth. These are classes forced upon the population by the implementation of a particular idea, a particular ideal. These religious servants do not have power, influence and wealth because they have accumulated these things on their own. They have these things because the word bearers have simply stated that they should. A feudal nobility system in all but name. And speaking of feudal, the world is also clearly kept quite in the dark. It appears as if they have little if any real knowledge of the larger Imperium. When the Ultramarines arrive, the population do not recognise them as legionnaires, as space marines. They view them as word bearers, despite the fact that grey is rather obviously a different colour than blue. Cyrene being the only one who notices, hey, that's a strange colour. I haven't seen that one before. And even the leadership of the planet clearly don't know much about the wider Imperium, as in their distress call, they say that the false angels who have arrived amongst them call themselves the 13th Legion, the warrior kings of Ultramar, as if they attribute no veracity to that claim as if they've never heard of them before and are utterly confused about the situation in which they have been placed in. And this is despite the fact that the planet does appear to have the technology required to know about the wider Imperium. They have shuttles, they have satellites, and they have the ability to communicate over interstellar distances, as demonstrated by their ability to send a distress beacon to the word bearers. And yet, it appears as if they have very little if any knowledge of that Imperium, which suggests a block or a ban, a taboo maybe, that has been put in place by the word bearers. But why would you do that? Why would you limit your perfect world, your perfect city, your perfect populace's access to information? Unless you were worried that once said population learned that there was an alternative out there, that there was an entire galaxy of people that did not believe like they believed, that maybe they would find that just as palatable, if not more so, than the word bearers view upon the world. In other words, Monarchia is not the perfect society. It is merely one shaped in the wishes of the word bearers, regardless of whether or not that is to the advantage of the population. And considering what's about to happen next, it might have been rather beneficial if they had a bit more knowledge about the wider Imperium, since the Emperor of course had decided to make Monarchia into an example. Now we do know a little bit more about why he chose to do this through other sources. He had tried to talk to Lorgar previously to dissuade him of his ideas of the Emperor as a god, to try and make him change his tact. The Emperor had tried other things before Monarchia, but the book doesn't mention any of those. What the book mentions is that the Ultramarines combat drop straight into Monarchia and all of the other cities across the planet step out of their stormbirds and their drop pods, aim their bolters at the confused and undoubtedly frightened civilian population and simply order them to evacuate the city. With very little if any explanation given beyond that it is the orders of the Emperor. 
and the populace responds in pretty much the only way any large body of confused civilians could ever possibly react to armed strangers suddenly appearing in their midst and threatening them, ordering them to abandon their homes and livelihood with confusion and anger. You don't need to be a strategic genius to predict that response. And yet, this plan was conceived by both the Emperor and Gilliman together in orbit above the planet right now. Huh. So you're telling me that the Emperor and Gilliman together came up with this as the best approach to evacuate the city on a compliant, loyal world. A city that has prayer speakers scattered throughout the entire bloody place. This, this was the solution. Not voxing local government representatives and ordering them to evacuate the city, utilising local law enforcement and the clergy, or utilising imperial army elements, or hell, even announcing your arrival, and then have the ultramarines move in in an organised and disciplined fashion, and then beginning to evict people in cooperation with local authorities. No, this orbital invasion strategy is the solution you came up with. Really? Why? <laughs> I mean, it's just... It's such a ridiculously bad plan, and it's apparently been created by Gilliman and the Emperor. First and foremost, the Emperor's not a retard. He is conquering the entire galaxy. He is forging human civilization anew. He's someone who has been alive for eons. He's not dumb, and Gilliman? Gilliman forces his legionnaires to serve as civil servants across the 500 worlds of Ultramar to prepare them for a post-crusade society. He wishes for them to be administrators, diplomats, and governors. And he doesn't know how to deal with a civilian population and evacuate them in an efficient fashion. Really? And then, to make matters even worse, some civilian, reacting in the only ways possible for a civilian population faced with this, anger and confusion, decides to toss a glass bottle at one of the ultramarines, because said civilian has no fucking clue what an Astartes is. And when that glass bottle shatters utterly and completely harmlessly off the reinforced power-armoured suit of an ultramarine, the Ultramarine then decides that the correct and proportional response to this threat is to open fire, full auto, with bolt guns, into the civilian populace. Do, do, do we have- are you sure we have the correct legion here? Their, their armor is blue, right? Not, not white trimmed in blue. We're not talking about the World Eaters here, are we? Because this does not seem like anything an Ultramarine would ever bloody do. Not only is every single member of the Ultramarine's Legion trained to act as much like a diplomat and a statesman as a warrior, they also fetishize discipline to a degree that only the Imperial Fists could truly appreciate. And yet, one of these legionnaires, an ultramarine, opens fire upon unarmed civilians because somebody tossed a bottle at him. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Right. A and what next? Oh, yes. The civilian population, still frightened and confused about what the hell is going on, responds to violence with violence. Again, you don't exactly need to be a strategic genius to envision this happening. And what do the Ultramarines do? Do they realize that perhaps shooting civvies is a bit of an overreaction, and march in as a police force and, hell, just 
corral them with their fists. This is an entire Astartes Legion dealing with what is almost exclusively unarmed civilians. And fuck, even the armed ones don't have weapons capable of threatening legionnaires. No. They send in tanks and land speeders and start slaughtering the population by the thousands. Ugh, it's just... What? What? Why? Why? Why is this happening? Why is any of this happening? It, it doesn't make sense from a character perspective, from the Ultramarines to do this. It doesn't make sense from a logical perspective. The Emperor wishes to make an example out of Monarchia, not the civilian populace. If he wished to make an example of them as well, he'd have just bombed the place with the people who are still in it. Hell, would have made for an even more powerful message. But no, he specifically orders for them to be evacuated, and he picks the Ultramarines, one of the most disciplined legions out there, to do so. Presumably to try and avoid the legionnaires going rabid and shooting civvies. <laughs> so much for that, I suppose. And there isn't even a practicality argument. The Ultramarines are making their task much more complicated by scaring the shit out of the civilian populace and making them fight back than if they had simply organized a proper evacuation. An entrenched civilian population actively resisting the evacuation order, <laughs> unsurprisingly, is going to be a bit more difficult to get moving than one that has simply been ordered to evacuate by local authorities in a cooperative manner. All of it simply makes absolutely no sense. Not from a logistical standpoint, from a tactical standpoint, from a strategical standpoint, or even just from the standpoint of making a point to the word bearers. The only reason why this is happening is because the book requires for there to be a massacre right about now, and for the Emperor to be somehow responsible for said massacre. And it is done in an incredibly ham-fisted and unbelievable fashion. At least if this had been done by the Space Wolves, maybe, you know, they could go a little berserk, or the World Eaters, possibly, or hell, the Iron Warriors, they could be called enough, but the Ultramarines, under the direct command of the Emperor and Gilliman, in a whole strike force organized specifically for this task, including, alongside with it, elite forces of the Adeptus Custodes. I mean, this wasn't something the Emperor just came up with one morning, like, oh, yep, yeah, I'm gonna go burn Monarchia now. This is his last gambit at getting Logar back in the fold. He has been preparing this for ages. This is his last recourse. And yet, it is done in this way. Now, I of course know why it's done in this way, and unfortunately, it is not an in-universe explanation. The author of The First Heretic, Aaron Dembski Bowden, has a very peculiar way of writing things. He writes Chaos characters very, very, very well. In fact, I think he writes Chaos better than almost anyone else, because he doesn't write them as just the villains. They are fully fleshed out interesting characters with their own motives, their own reasons for what they are doing, their own world view. But unfortunately, as good as he is at writing chaos, he is as bad if not worse at writing Imperium or Loyalist characters, the Emperor in particular. He writes the Emperor as a complete and utter moron, blind to any and all consequence that appears to make every single worst possible decision imaginable, as if he actively pursues the worst possible outcome. And in this case, the Emperor's atrocities is basically utilized as an excuse for Logar to turn traitor, as the reason for why he and his legion turn crazy. The reason, again, being that the Emperor suddenly, for some unexplained reason, decided to massacre a civilian populace, which there was absolutely no reason or need whatsoever to actually do. I mean, hell, 
They've already taken out all means of communication from the planet, destroyed all the satellite and blocked all of the communication. They could literally just take however long was necessary to evacuate the cities and then let them call for the word bearers. The whole thing is just utterly retarded. And the worst part is, there is absolutely no explanation or reason given whatsoever. At least a couple of pages with explanation for why the Emperor decided to do the absolute dumbest possible thing would have gone a long way to making at least somewhat believable. Instead, unfortunately, we are left with Emperor bad because bad. <laughs> Ironically enough, the precise reason why Adam Dembski Bowden is so good at writing chaos, the fact that he doesn't just make them the villains, is also why he's so absolutely dreadful at writing the Emperor, because he just makes him the villain, with no further explanation or reason provided. And we will be seeing plenty more retardation on behalf of the Emperor, but for now, let's get back to the word bearers who arrive on scene two months later, after receiving Monarchia's distress call. Two months. <laughs> Yet further emphasizing just how retarded the one week forced evacuation was. We also get our first indication that maybe, just maybe, the word bearers had been corrupted to some level from the very get-go. Several of their chapters appeared to be carrying chaos imagery. Very clear chaos imagery as well, like the chapter of the ossified throne, for example. Their chapter imagery is a pile of skulls forming a throne. <laughs> Fairly blatant. Or the chapter of the serrated sun, whose mark is an eight-pointed star. And they also use quite a lot of skulls and blood in their traditions as well. And from what we will eventually learn about the ancient religion on Colchis, it definitely sounds quite chaosy. And indeed, if it was not for Lorgar's religious rebellion against this faith in the name of his own belief in the God Emperor, in all due likelihood the entire planet would have been raised from orbit as the Emperor would have been more than able to recognize the clear patterns in its religion. This, by the way, is also probably one of the reasons why the Emperor had allowed this to go as far as it had. The Emperor and the Imperium at large was utterly convinced of Lorgar's loyalty. It was unquestionable, without doubt, without any sort of qualifier whatsoever. And the Emperor also undoubtedly gave Lorgar a great deal of leeway due to the fact that he had risen up in revolt against something that the Emperor must have recognized as a clearly chaos-inspired religion. Surely that meant that Lorgar recognized the evil of that religion, right? But Monarchia was a bit too much, in fact the entire planet was. It is one thing to have rumours swirling around that the word bearers were secretly worshipping the Emperor and ignoring his decrees that he was no god but merely a mortal man. It is one thing hell to even know that these rumours were true as long as the word bearers kept it somewhat secretive. But with the word bearers building entire cities dedicated purely to the idolatry and worship of the Emperor, that is harder to ignore. And not merely just from an imperial standpoint, with the word bearers clearly not giving a rat's ass about the Emperor's decree, but also from the standpoint of what the Emperor knows about chaos and what he was seeing in cities like Monarchia and across the various worlds conquered by the word bearers bore a worrying resemblance to idolatry and organized religious worship, the very thing the Emperor was trying to stamp out due to the threat he perceived it to be. And so, it was time for sterner means. Talking to Lorgar had yielded no results. Censoring Lorgar had yielded no results. 
and even outright banning the worship of the Emperor and indirect condemnation of Lorgar's beliefs had yielded no results. The Emperor was running out of options. He needed to make Lorgar understand the error of his ways and change them before the Emperor was left with only one option, the final one. And so, since nothing else was working, in his presumed desperation, the Emperor went for a message that simply could not be overlooked, the destruction of the word bearer's perfect city. Not only was this certain to grab Lorgar's attention, it would also allow the Emperor to send a loud and unmistakable message to the rest of the galaxy, that he would not tolerate any forms of worship in his Imperium, even if it was worship of himself. But it is also important to point out that this was done precisely to avoid that final solution, and so, after having bombarded Monarchia, on a schedule, for some reason, the Emperor was then trying to de-escalate the situation. When the word bearers arrived two months later, that being seven weeks after the orbital bombardment, I will not let that fucking retardation go ever, just pointing that out, the Imperial fleet in orbit above Monarchia was broadcasting their identification on all frequencies. This would ensure that when the word bearers arrived, there was no mistaking the identity of the fleet above the planet. Which is probably a good idea considering the fact that the word bearers were likely to be a bit angry when they arrived. The word bearers were then ordered to all disembark near Monarchia all 100,000 of them. <laughs> Did I mention that the word bearers had been a bit on the lazy side when it came to the whole conquering the galaxy thing? Well, it had the benefit of making sure that there were a hell of a lot of word bearers around, if nothing else. And stood opposite the 100,000 world bearers was a mere 100 ultramarines, a single company the 19th, with Gilliman at the head. To put this into perspective, there were 100 chaplains in the Word Bearers Legion. <laughs> there were as many chaplains present on that planet as there were ultramarines in total. This, in all due likelihood, was an attempt on behalf of the Emperor to de-escalate the situation, but on the other hand, he also ordered that Lorgar Stormbird be escorted down to the planet's surface by ultramarine gunships with their weapons trained at it, so... If he was trying to de-escalate, he wasn't doing a particularly good job at it. Oh, and as a bit of a side note, the book also reveals the origin of the Crozier's Arcanum. Apparently all Crozius, originally carried first and foremost by the word bearer's chaplain, and then much later on by the various other chapters, were originally based on the design of Lorgar's great war mace, Illuminarum, although the modern Crozius has gone very far from that original inspiration because, well, even at the best of days, Illuminarum was a huge, dark, spiked war mace. Not exactly your typical icon of holy purity and all that. But returning to the whole Ultramarines trying to not piss off the world bearers unnecessarily thing, in another attempted conciliatory gesture, the Emperor sends Malkador the Sigilite down to talk to Lorgar. This, just like the whole gunship thing, seems like an attempt at de-escalation, but again it's a rather dumb one. Lorgar does not like Malkador. He does not like Malkador at all. You might go so far as to say that he outright hates him. In reality, Lorgar's not overly fond of mortals in general, it appears, and so sending Malkador to deliver the bad news... Well... Once again, a less than entirely diplomatic choice. 
made even worse by the fact that Malkador and, hell, the Ultramarines as well, don't really understand what's going on. And so they are genuinely shocked and surprised when Lorgar reacts with such overwhelming anger towards them, and even more than anger, confusion. Lorgar professes to not understand why the Ultramarines did this, why Malkador did this, and loudly claims that they must have lost their minds. This, of course, yet further confuses Malkador, which asks Lorgar if he truly does not know what is going on here, and he does so in an almost argumentative fashion, as if he himself is utterly convinced that Lorgar must know why this has happened, and that Lorgar is just acting the fool for outrage's sake. But I don't actually believe so. I think that Lorgard is genuinely confused as to why this happened because of the way Lorgard views the universe and views worship. Lorgard has redefined the term, because worship is of course outlawed in the Imperium. This is why Malkador states that they attacked the world because it was non-compliant. Because as far as the Imperium was concerned, it was non-compliant. It was openly rejecting Imperial law against organized worship, which is outright banned. The Imperium at this point in time is a militantly atheist empire. So how then can Lorgar possibly be genuinely confused about this? Surely this was in direct violation of Imperial law, and this should be no surprise whatsoever. But this is where the redefining of words come into play. Because Lorgar, of course, does not view this as a worship in a religious sense. He says as much, as far as he is concerned, this is loyalty. In fact, it is the highest form of loyalty. But how can he think this? How can he not understand that because this loyalty took the form of worship, that is why it was cleansed? Well, that is because Lorgar does not view this as worship. Lorgar views worship as worship of a deity in the traditional sense, a mythical godlike being, a divine thing that cannot be proven to exist. The Emperor, however, he is real, and the reason why Lorgar considers him a god is not because he is a god in the traditional sense, as already mentioned, but because he has the powers of a god. That power makes him a deity, and since he is real, then worship of him cannot possibly be worship in the traditional sense, because that denotes the worship of an ethereal, ill-defined entity and therefore, worship of the Emperor, because he is real, is not worship at all, it is loyalty. And, since it is not worship, it also does not break any Imperial laws or bans against worship. It certainly requires a bit of doublethink and some redefining of terms and words, but it seems to make sense from the perspective that Lorgar views the world, and would also explain why he seems genuinely surprised and outraged that this happened to Monarchia. This of course makes the whole situation even more difficult for Malkador and the guys trying to chastise Lorgar, because they are using the same words but with different meaning. And so, when Malkador continues trying to insist and explain this, Lorgar backhands him. So, yeah, Malkador's dead now, right? He's, what, 762 years old? His bones are about as sturdy as flapperjackers, and he just got backhanded by a Primarch in the face. He he's dead, except he isn't. He's just, you know, lightly bruised. <laughs> Some fucking hell. I mean, for the love of the god emperor, Lorgar smacked him 20 meters? I think even a hale and hearty human would probably be going tits up at that point. And so now it's Gilliman that has to deal with the angry Lorgar. And Gilliman is trying very hard to be as dispassionate and detached from all of this as possible. Argeltal describes him as what was the phrase? That he has seen automatons of the Adeptus Mechanica with more humanity in them. Now we know that Gilliman can be quite the lively and camaraderie chap when he wants to, 
But right now, he is clearly trying to quash down on everything, to present a perfectly neutral and unjudgmental front to Lorgar, both so that Lorgar will not be interested in venting his anger on him, hopefully, and so as to make it absolutely clear that this was not an act done out of vengeance or passion or any form of personal dislike, rather, this was a cold, calculated action of law. And when Lorgar asks him again why he did this, he simply says that he was ordered to. And Lorgar immediately assumes that he was ordered to do so by Malkador, which is interesting. It didn't occur to him that this was the Emperor, and when he is told that this was by the Emperor's orders, he is utterly disbelieving of this. He does not understand at all. It seems clear that he was working under the assumption that the Emperor's definition of worship, etc., was the same as his own. This, again, despite the two having had several conversations on this topic previously. Clearly, Lorgar's usage of well, words that meant something other than the words actually meant had been confusing to most. I would go so far as to perhaps even postulate that maybe the Emperor thought that he had explained all of this to Lorgar, that he had made his wishes known, but since the two, well, were speaking with words meaning different things, they arrived at different conclusions. This is one of the problems with redefining terms and words. You can never quite know whether or not you've actually reached a consensus, or whether or not you are simply not speaking the same language. And I believe this is the case because of how the Emperor appears. Lorgar states that when he looks at him, as whenever he looks at him, the Emperor seems to almost shift between personas, being a... Uh, sad old man, a stern warlord, that he can see love in his eyes, that he can see disgust in his eyes, and the Emperor appears to reflect a persona that other people wishes to see. The Emperor is also very clearly fully in command of how he is perceived by other people, as demonstrated on multiple occasions previously. He is more than enough powerful of a psyker to quite literally dictate how he appears and comes across to mortals, to the point that he is able to blind every single word bearer on the field with a golden light, whilst allowing the Ultramarines to be utterly unafflicted by this light. And if he appears as multiple things, and such contradictionary things as well, a stern visage, a sad one, a loving one, and at the same time also one of disgust, this suggests that the Emperor is almost as confused as Lorgar, that he too does not understand why it had to come to this, that he had clearly tried to communicate these ideas with Lorgar and got nowhere and that now he is saddened by the fact that he has to do this, yet still also cognizant of the fact that he needs to deliver a stern warning to Lorgar so as to avoid the only alternative that would be left to him if Lorgar would not change his ways. This then was the do or die moment. Lorgar would have to convince Lorgar, and Lorgar would have to listen. Otherwise, the next set of consequences would be considerably more grim than the mere annihilation of an entire city from orbit. Surely the Emperor had prepared quite some speech for Lorgar to make sure that that would not be necessary. <laughs> yeah, about all of that. We will have to talk about that in the next episode. But fear not, for this is, after all, the Horus Heresy lore breakdown, and so that episode will arrive already tomorrow. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.